Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another star-studded Linux 18 Toscast podcast. And I must say, we have another terrific full show lined up. We have lots of guests. So at this time, let me transfer the microphone to my good co-host, Spatry, and he will get us started. Take it away, Spatry. All right. Yeah, that's right. It's another fabulous Toscast podcast with the Linux A-Team, and we've got a special lineup for you guys today. First, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Alan Pope with Canonical, and he has joined us today. We also have, from Australia, Infinitely Galactic. We have Pingcasts from Linux Soup with us today, and then we have a newcomer, Sis Admin Girl. She's doing tutorials for beginners, and uh, she has over 14 years of experience, systems administration, and that sort of thing. Welcome, one and all, and back to you, Total OS, today. Thank you, Spatry. Uh, first of all, I have to say a little something to Mr. Pope. First of all, welcome abo- aboard the show, Mr. Pope. It is an honor Thanks to have a... Thank you. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, there was a nice comment on Spatry's channel. I think the comment was something like, uh, hey, I like it when Toss uh, says this word. So I will say it to you, Mr. Pope. Mr. Pope, what's up? Um, <laughs> yes, in yes. fact, two weeks ago, Hello. one of my friends said, uh, hi, yes, yeah, two, two weeks ago, one of my friends said, hey, what computer system do you use? What's up? No, moving on. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Alan. Welcome, Tanya. And by the way, Tanya, your videos are terrific. They are short. Oh, thank you so point. much. They are short. Yeah, they are short to the point that even a Windows dummy like myself can understand. Thank you. They're meant okay. for everybody. I know, I know. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess let me get started with some questions about Ubuntu. Um Alan, last year when Ubuntu first released Unity to the world, it wasn't particularly well received by the uh, at least some in the Linux community. I myself like it then. I love it now. I have uh, Unity installed in three of my machines. But I guess my question is, how did Canonical react, you know, to those criticisms? And what do you think, based on that, what do you think is the future of Ubuntu with Unity? Um. Well, a couple of things. First of all, I, I'm actually, despite my introduction, I'm not actually a developer. I'm an engineering manager at Canonical, but... Um, Sorry. Oh, okay. It's fine. My bad. It's not a problem. Um, the, the thing about um, the way that Canonical reacts is we're a bunch of individual developers. There's over 500 people who work for Canonical now. And so everyone reacts in a different way. Some people will um, sympathize with the um, the reaction to Unity. Some people will vehemently disagree with it. Um, you know, everyone's got their own opinion. So I think it really depends who you ask. Um, personally, I can see why people uh, resisted Unity uh, and I can see why people got upset when um, we switched to Unity as the default desktop. Um, however, I have my own opinions about the fact that where I see Ubuntu and Unity going in the future. Um, and so I'm I'm kind of in it for the long game. I I, I can see that we've had a few bumps and perhaps a couple of releases haven't been top notch, but we're addressing that with 1204 and, and a lot of the reaction, um, we've, um, taken on board and we've listened to people and we know people have complained about certain things like the menus and multi monitor support and the way the launcher behaves and stuff like that. And we do listen to that and I know because I often sit with the designers in our London office, that that they do take that on board and they are planning for uh, the next release, 1204, and the release beyond that and beyond that, you know, into into next year. So so in short, you know, we're all human and uh, we take it on the chin, but we're looking to improve things. Okay. Uh, by the way, I do have a suggested name for the next release. How about Quantum Quail? It's just a thought, but uh, yeah, quail. yeah, yeah. There's not Quantum. that many animals that begin with Q, so no, yeah, no. Sure. In fact, I was thinking about this last night. The Q. Well, there's there's the Q character from Star Trek, but that's not the same, though. But uh, <clears throat> um, okay, that's a fair enough answer. Um, I do have one more question before I forget, and this is something that really kind of 
kind of gets to me. One second. On. Tell me, tell me how you feel. Okay, my question is this: Why is it so freaking impossible to create a simple Linux-based screencast recorder with a simple on-off switch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a pain, isn't it? I, do you know, I'm, I'm I, um, I've been using various tools for doing screencasting for for some time, and I've tried them all, and in various ways, every single one of them suck. Um, and Thank you, sir. It's not just <laughs> you. Oh, you're totally right. I don't, I don't think any, anyone's written a perfect screencasting app. There is one that, that I'm um, involved in in terms of, you know, helping the developer I, uh, testing and, and that. And it's called Kazam, K-A-Z-A-M. Um, Kazam for the win. You got it. Yeah, it's pretty good. And, and there's some features in there that I've, you know, suggested to the developer, uh, David, who's, who's working, you know, really hard on it. And he's okay. put it in got it into the repository in Ubuntu now, so you can, you know, in 12.04 and above, you can just app get installed Kazam or, you know, Software Center or whatever. It's not perfect, but it's under active development, which can't be said of pretty much any other screencasting app on the Linux desktop. So so I'm focusing my attention on Kazam. Okay, one last quick thing. When are my customizations coming back in Unity They were the way they were in GNOME too, such as right-click, Add to applets on the panel bar. I mean, is that gone? Um, what you mean, icons along the top bar, uh, along the top. Yeah, the like screen. to add like applets, like the weather applet, or you know how in like you know like two years ago in Unity or not Unity, but in Ubuntu, you could just go to the panel bar, right click to add the applets, like the weather sure. applet. Yeah, I'm I'm not entirely sure, but I, I have a feeling that was taken out when we went to GNOME three. Right, um, but 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 oh. is that coming back, or is that something that is completely gone? Well, I think it's it is back in in a way in that um, for example there's there's one that shows um, system information like CPU memory swap and all yeah. that kind of stuff and I've added that one to my my system panel okay um, but we call it a different name now so it's called the right. indicator area that that right, whole area right. in the top right hand corner of the screen is for what we call indicators and um, yeah I, I've I've installed that it's not it's not quite as straightforward as, you know, right click, add to panel, and there's a predefined list of, of That's what I miss. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I miss that too in some ways, but equally, I am kind of liking the clean, um, desktop. And, um, I, I, I quite like not having too much stuff up there, but I can appreciate that other people feel differently. That's fine. So I think I didn't okay, quite. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, no, that, but that's. I, a fair enough answer. Uh, let's see. Well, thank you. Um, Tanya, how about if you ask a question or a comment? Well, I'm just wondering where they see Unity taking Ubuntu. I mean, I'm sure everybody's wondering that, right? We hear a lot. I see a lot of press releases and stuff, but I'm just wondering his opinion. Um, so Mark blogged, Mark Shuttleworth, um, who's the you know commercial sponsor and design lead for um Canonical and Ubuntu blogged a little while ago that, you know, he's, he's, he's made these pronouncements like, you know, we're going to have 200 million users in a couple of years and. That would be amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I would love that. Um, what's he smoking? um, Um, well, it's not, it's not that hard given that we're already well over 20 million. So, you know, it's a factor of 10. But that's still a tiny, even if we went to 200 million, that's a tiny dent in the market, in the Windows market. So I don't think it's that hard. And he also blogged about the fact that by 2014, he wanted to be on other devices. So on the TV, on the tablet, on a phone, that kind of thing. And we've seen some of that in uh, press releases and demonstrations at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show and Mobile World Congress last week, where there was a convergence device and the TV was shown off and they're both running Ubuntu. So if you think you could buy a TV with Ubuntu on, if you could do that, then that instantly means you could potentially get many millions more users. Okay, they're not using the desktop, but they're they're still using Ubuntu and it's still Unity. So perhaps that 200 million target, which is kind of aspirational, but perhaps that could be hit by branching out to other devices like tablets, phones, TVs, fridges, toasters, you know, whatever. Possibly, sure. Possibly, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And I don't, I don't think that's an unreasonable aspiration, given, you know, arguably the desktop market is somewhat dying. You know, people people don't generally buy desktop PCs anymore. Most people buy laptops and a lot of people seem to be buying tablets and, you know, people. OK, that's not that's not everyone. And, you know, there are certain yeah. parts of the world where you can't afford a tablet and you know, a laptop is prohibitive, prohibitively expensive. But still, a lot of people are buying them. So it makes sense for us to be in that in that kind of space as well, as well as Android and iOS and all the other options. No, I think you're absolutely right. If you somehow get a microchip in the Android smartphone, you could definitely reach that goal. And I, you know, really hope that's possible because I would love to see Ubuntu in more people's hands. Okay. Yeah, totally. I'd love yeah. to have a, a, a phone that ran Ubuntu that I could, you know, go, hey, look at that. That's running Ubuntu. You know. Yeah, I saw the videos. They look really cool. I would love to have one when they come out. So, <laughs> so Matt, yeah, well, can you bring my desktop <laughs> around with me? Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, and I saw that article myself, and I just thought that was the coolest thing since sliced bread. Here you've got a phone that has your Ubuntu system on it. You just dock it at home, and then you have, and then your phone turns into a full-blown computer. How cool is that? I mean, you know, this is this is really going to bring Linux into the computing world in a big, big way, and I'm. You know, being a broadcaster, you know, I'm doing my best to stay on top of the news. And uh, Canonical is really doing a lot of different things. We've got web TV that's going to, or Ubuntu TV that's coming out soon. And then now we're going to have the uh, handheld portable devices that people are going to uh, be able to uh, use as well. And... Um, I'm really pleased with the direction that Canonical is taking. Yeah, it's exciting times. Okay. Um, let's see. IG, you want to chime in? Yeah, um, I was just reading a very interesting article uh, that was uh, pretty much, I mean, obviously 1204 is ramping up and, and there there is uh, sort of a lot going on in the blogosphere around uh, the you know this new this new release that is going to be sort of like the hallmark the stable long term support and all that and uh, and it was it had a very interesting slant on it in that and and this is something that I've come across a lot and I really feel like Ubuntu is doing a fantastic job and, and you guys are doing a really great job with the design aspect of making this system something that an everyday user can to, can walk up to muck around with for a bit and sort of click with it and and it makes sense and it's very easy and, it's, and it looks just gorgeous uh, but the, the thing that this article was talking about was just the the, the uh, sphere of apps that are built up around uh, the Linux system and just sort of the, the um, what would be the word, the like the disconnectedness of, of the app universe and that there are so many like different app libraries that are all built into Ubuntu and it has to try and uh, build a compatibility for all of these different libraries and all of these different toolkits. Uh, and basically what it's saying is if we want more users on the Ubuntu side, we really need quality apps and, and apps that are built with, you know, Ubuntu in mind. And people really feel like that's where, for instance, uh, Mac OS X and iOS are really succeeding. It's not so much the platform as it's the apps that are built for the platform. And, uh, and so, you know, long term, uh, you know, once, once Unity is at a, a polished state uh, where you guys are, you know, happy with it, um, do you see do you see Ubuntu or Canonical taking on any sort of uh, application development? That's an excellent question, and I I completely agree with you. I it is a it is a big issue that you know if if we put a tablet computer out there tomorrow, um, and I can tell you for now that's not going to happen. Um, if we did, um, and it ran Ubuntu standard, you know Ubuntu with Unity. Um, it would probably suck pretty badly for everyone because the user interface isn't designed for touch. So we've got some work to do there to make it work well on a touch environment. I know a lot of people think that Unity was totally trying to get the tablet interface on the desktop because it's got icons that look a bit like iPhone and Android icons, but that's not really the case. Um, so if, if, if we if we put a tablet out tomorrow, we've got the problem that the user interface isn't ideal for a tablet, but also, as you say, there aren't the apps for it. If you go to the software center and install any number of the many thousands of quality apps there are in the open source world through the software center, most of them won't work very well on a touch screen. You know, they have pop-up dialogues that 
that aren't appropriate on a on a touch screen or they they have tiny little buttons that are really fiddly to hit with your finger especially for someone like me who's got really fat fingers and you know my targeting isn't the best um whereas when you look at something like an ipad or an android tablet everything is kind of designed for that purpose and for that device so um yeah there's going to have to be some work done to get some decent apps or convert existing apps you know convert uh, some of the um, apps that we already know and love, like Thunderbird, like Firefox, like Chromium, and and all these these apps, so that they work well in a tablet environment. And and there's a lot of work to do there, and that and that's partly the reason why there isn't a decent Ubuntu tablet out there today, because there aren't the applications that support that interface. Pincast, have you tried Ubuntu 1204? Uh, I have not tried it yet. Okay. You should. It's really good. <laughs> it is. As a I've matter heard. of fact, I want to read to you some of the comments that uh, I have received from my uh, podcast that I put up early, early, early this morning. I actually uh, installed this in a virtual machine, and I actually like this so much I'm going to dual boot my computer and uh, run the new Ubuntu uh, 1204. And uh, here's one of the comments that I received. I actually have the Ubuntu 1204 Beta 1 fully installed on my hard drive, and I am loving it. It keeps the privacy-minded user at heart, allowing you to check what activities you want monitored and what activities you don't. You can clear bash history and uh, dash history all from one easy spot. The new sound menu is amazing, too. The Internet is blazing fast, and for a beta, it hasn't crashed once. Best part is Canonical is already pushing out bug fixes. I already had a bunch of updates. Great OS. That was from Live for the Game 1, and um, there was another one here. That's nice um, to hear, but... um uh, I've had crashes. <laughs> it's far from perfect, you know. We've, we've mm-hmm. got we've got a couple of months left to go until release, and um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to give anyone the impression that it's a finished, polished product right now. There's, Thank you, sir. Thank you for the, being the, honest. I appreciate it's, it. <laughs> it. It's it's not finished. <laughs> no, but it's still an amazing product. It's performing very well, and I really like yes. the changes you've done in this release. So. Am I the only one who hasn't tried it? Apparently. We know you will. We know you will. Any minute. <laughs> yeah, what's the matter with you guys? No, just <laughs> Hey. Yes, I can, I can definitely okay. affirm that uh, it's a very well-performing system. I've, I've been running it uh, as a dual boot ever, ever since it came out. And um, although I haven't had any system crashes yet, I would definitely yeah, say it, it's uh, it's actually, you know, it's definitely beating out quality-wise uh, from what 11.10 was at the at the beta point. And that's that's something we've focused on. Like we said right from the start of 1204, we're, this release is all about quality, and um, not just you know it, it looks better and it, and it feels better, but equally inside Canonical, the QA process and the testing process for every bit that we make, the Unity, the the launcher and the dash and all the lenses and all that kind of stuff, all that stuff goes through a huge amount of QA before it leaves the door. And, and you know, I work with the guys who, who sit there um, doing automated tests every time someone commits a, a new uh, feature or even just a bug fix. There's automated testing going on to make sure that it, il- it all still functions as it did previously. Um, and then there's loads of manual tests as well. And we sit there for you know hours, literally hours, uh, manually going through, pressing buttons and seeing and making sure that the system reacts in the same way that we designed it to react. So... So there's certainly a big focus on quality. It's it's not quite there yet, but it's a lot better than than previous releases, that's for sure. And even early this this early on in the game, it, it's definitely showing. Good, good. That's good to hear. Nice. Also, yeah, yeah. I'm also really glad that you're listening to the users because I know a lot of people were disgruntled because they felt like they weren't being listened to. And then you mentioned earlier that you're listening to more of the users' requests and you're taking that into consideration with it. I think it's awesome. Do you know what? There's um there's a there's a popular um blog which focuses a lot on Unity. It's called OMG Ubuntu. You've probably heard of it. And mm-hmm. um, awesome site. The, the yes. I, I was recently at a, a canonical um company business event 
where there was a whole load of developers, you know, hacking away on on various projects. And as I walked around, it was interesting to see how many people were not only reading the articles, but also scrolling down and reading the comments and reading the comments on mm -hmm. YouTube videos. And, you know, we do read that stuff. I know people think we don't, but we honestly do. And, you know, sometimes, you know, if, if a comment is just unity sucks and, and that's that's all someone says, then that's not even remotely useful to us. But if someone says, hey, I, I tried out Unity and when I click here, this breaks and doesn't work. And, you know, we, we take that on board and see if there's a bug filed and, and try and work on it and fix it. Interesting. And that's something I feel, yeah, sorry, Spatry. That's something I feel the open source community has. And, and that's I think it's a, it's a very valuable part of, uh, of what you guys do. Now, interestingly enough, I've been uh, keeping up with the news. It looks like there are people working on porting Unity over to Arch Linux. And uh, I'm actually liking the way that Unity has uh, evolved. And this is actually something I would consider using and incorporating into my Arch system, especially if I can get it to work horizontal horizontally rather than vertically and that sort of thing. But as I said, I'm still going to dual boot and run Ubuntu as a uh, as a uh, as a secondary operating system, but uh, I really like how it's starting to shape up. I think it's that's, really going in the right direction. That's certainly a, a criticism that I've seen leveled uh, a number of times. Is um, people complain that Ubuntu is uh, sorry Unity is Ubuntu only. You know, you you only get Unity in the Ubuntu repository, and no other distro carries it. And I know there have been attempts made to port it across to Fedora and to um, Arch, and I think someone tried to port it across to uh, SUSE. Um, but it's, it's, it's not an easy task to do, um, because mm -hmm. Unity, the 3D version, is implemented as a, as a Compiz plugin. Mm -hmm. and I don't think many other distros actually ship um, up-to-date Compiz in their, um, in their repositories. So, you know, we, mm -hmm. we employ one of the Compiz developers, and he's, he's constantly churning out new versions to keep up with um, you know the Unity developers, and so all of this stuff is is moving so fast that it doesn't surprise me that it's hard for mm -hmm. other distros to carry it in their repositories because it's just it's, it's a moving target and it's very hard for them. Well, uh, is it? But well, I have to ask: though, Is it really your job to make sure it's working on you know the thousands and thousands of other distros out there? Not, well, it's not our job. I mean, it would be good, and you know, yeah, it would be, nice would be good. It, but is it your responsibility? I'd have to, because you know, it's not your distro. Well, arguably, you know, I could see an argument where people would say yes, it is, because the more distros that it's in, the more users it has. The more users it has, the more testing it gets, um, and the more exposure you know it gets. And people don't think that this is Ubuntu just going in its own direction and leaving everyone else. Um, I want to say leaving everyone else behind. I don't mean that in a derogatory sense that we're ahead of everyone, but just leaving what they're doing going in another direction, if that makes sense. Um, but I, I don't know. Maybe in the future, uh, and given that we're going to have an LTS, so this is a long-term support release in April, that code base is going to be frozen for that release. So maybe people will pick it up in 12.04 and then port those versions across to other distros. I don't know. I have a good question uh, that I'd like to ask. Um, uh, Alan, uh, what is uh, Ubuntu or Canonical going to be doing about marketing? Now, we know that we've got all these innovations that uh, that uh, Ubuntu is, or Canonical is bringing to the table. Uh, what are they going to do to market this and to bring some competition into the marketplace? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so... Ubuntu started in 2004, and throughout mm -hmm. all those years, we've relied on the community doing the marketing for us, mostly. So we have teams in every country, uh, which we affectionately call loco teams, the loco standing for <laughs> local community teams, <laughs> not loco as in... You know, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. You guys are nuts, but okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that could be argued as well. Um, but, but they... Um, they do their local their local advocacy and marketing and you know people give talks like like for example i gave a talk at my local linux user group um near where i live um and i just called it you know unity zero to hero you know learn how to use it kind of thing and all i did was plug my laptop into a projector and just show people how to use it 
And if that results in some people maybe changing their opinion of Unity and seeing that actually it is usable, it's not a complete mess and it doesn't completely suck, then that's great. And I've done my job in my spare time um, speaking to a bunch of like-minded, you know, geeks. Um, but what we what we don't tend to do is um, big advertising campaigns in magazines or on TV or anything like that because a they are prohibitively expensive like it's uh-huh. ridiculously expensive to get a slot on TV and we're a global company with a presence in just about every country so which country do we pick to advertise in do we pick do we advertise in all of them or do we just do America or do we just do Europe or just do we just do England uh-huh. you know it's 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 a tricky one and, and we just don't have the budget to to spend on vast marketing campaigns which is which is why we rely on the community doing that for us mm-hmm. if, if i can just pop in a comment there um i mean really uh when it comes down to you know uh, when you look at apple as as a company uh they are you know a real uh innovator as well as the more importantly their marketing is is really what has gotten them as far as they have now obviously Canonical doesn't have anywhere near the budget that a company like <laughs> Apple does, but uh, bringing quality, like uh, just explanation sort of videos, you know, with every product launch that Apple does, uh, there's always uh, there's always a video or something that they make about that ju- just practically shows off everyday people using these features, and and videos like that, I think, uh, you know, even just to put them on YouTube, uh, you know, they can get shared around, and it's the people that are on the internet that are going to be interested in Ubuntu anyway. I mean, at least that's what I've found from experience. And uh, so if, if people can, if, if, you know, community members like, like us, YouTubers like us, can point other, other YouTube viewers to a particular video that's endorsed, made by Canonical, sort of marketing your own product. Um, and and there, there are examples that, you know, you guys have put out, uh, which have been pretty good. But, yeah, just having like a sort of like a feature or a flagship sort of video that represents what you guys do uh, in, a, in a very sort of human way uh, uh, a very sort of human way, then I, you know, I, I, I dare say that it would be uh, a fairly easy thing to, you know, circulate that around the net uh, with, you know, fairly minimal costs. Yeah, and I, and I completely agree with you. That that kind of, uh, I don't want to say viral marketing, but the, you know, the kind of guerrilla marketing that, that that people do on on YouTube is very effective. And um, and actually, it's it's interesting you should say that. I had a meeting about that just this week um, about making. Uh, videos about 1204 um, and, and actually one of the subjects that came up is golly don't all screencasting apps in Ubuntu suck and uh, so so yeah we, we are looking yes, at that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah we are looking at that one of the, one of the problems is um, we did we did have one made um, for the last release and we um, one of the guys in the design team made it and one of the problems with these, these videos if you're if you're showing these aspirational videos where you show um, clips of the desktop and you know, interspersed with a bit of music and maybe you see someone editing a document and maybe you see someone chatting on IM, you know, the kind of marketing things that show what the product does without someone sitting and explaining it, you know, telling you. Um, when you make those kind of things, you're appealing to certain people who can um, relate to what they see on the screen. And if they hear one type of music, it might completely throw them off. Or if they see someone editing a document, they might think, oh, this is for business users. Or if a business person sees someone um, chatting on instant messenger, they might think, well, I don't want that in my corporate environment. So it's very difficult for us to create a one one video, one size fits all video that, that we could show anyone in the world. And they would say, yeah, that looks great. I want to use that. So I think probably what we'll have to do is create a number of these videos and and have different personas portrayed in each one of the videos, you know, to highlight different aspects of the desktop and to target different types of people, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, uh, to be to be quite frank, that's exactly what um, Apple does in a sense, having different yeah. videos, showing different people, different circumstances, different, you know, elements of the product that you want to be pushing forward. Mm. But like I say, we don't have the budget to do what Apple do, but... Um, we'll try. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, if I may give you just a little bit of piece of advice, keep up the terrific work. I love Ubuntu Unity, but please stay away from recommending ATI drivers. 
Uh, uh, yeah, Spatry knows the uh, story two weeks ago when we did the last uh, Linux 18 podcast. <laughs> I had an issue. Um, uh, Spatry kissed my kernels, okay? Uh, <laughs> but uh, let me explain briefly what happened, Alan. Um, I downloaded Ubuntu, dual, uh, dual booted on my desktop. And a little dialog box pops up. Hey, there are recommended drivers, hardware drivers, tested by Ubuntu, de- tested by Ubuntu developers. I'm like, oh, okay. Installed it, rebooted, eh, didn't work. Uh, deleted Ubuntu, reinstalled it, and one of the kind uh, subscribers suggested I try the brand new ATI drivers from the ATI website. I'm like, okay. Install that, rebooted, eh, didn't work. I said, you know what? I think I've had enough of this. So for the third time, I installed Ubuntu. <laughs> yes, Patrick, yeah, okay. I installed Ubuntu the third time with the open source drivers. No problem. So right now, right now, ATI drivers and the little recommendation, Ubuntu recommendation dialog box can kiss my you-know-what. <laughs> but that's my rant of the day. Other than that, you guys are doing a terrific job. And really, you know, Unity is one of the technological marvels of, you know, of the world, and it's free. But that little blip, that just really... Uh, you know, just... that's, that's interesting that, that we... we it's, the wor- it's all about the wording, because it, in, if you've got an NVIDIA card then that word recommended. We recommend the binary NVIDIA driver because okay. without it, you're not going to get the full 3D, you know, accelerated experience. Sure, But sure. for ATI, using that same wording, you know, we're kind of leading you down a path of failure. <laughs> Which <laughs> No, really? I never would have guessed. But no, I, uh, no, I mean, other than that, uh, Ubuntu has been stellar. So my, yeah. one, my one recommendation I would say for anyone who has any problems with to um, we have an amazing community support um, group people all around the world who just volunteer their time to answer technical questions and the one of the places that I've found really good for, for asking questions and getting high quality answers pretty quickly is a website called askubuntu.com I and, second um, yes yeah yeah it's brilliant the, the guys there just spend you know all their time answering questions curating them tagging them you know marking them as duplicates all that kind of stuff it's it, it's amazing the amount of work these people do just in their own time and they, and this they even have you know canonical people who work on certain products um if we see a question on ask ubuntu um say for example there's a guy who works for canonical who works on the um, installer his name's colin watson he's a complete genius but with everything to do with the installer if i see a question on ask ubuntu and i don't know the answer i know he will and I'll, I'll mm-hmm. give them a little, you know, poke online and say, can you have a look at this question? And they'll spend their time answering questions as well. And that's, that's another thing that, you know, you don't get from Apple and, and Microsoft. You don't get the people who actually mm-hmm. create the product answering your technical questions, like, one-on-one uh, right. online. And I think that's fantastic. Yes. Yeah, that have to be, sorry, I don't think we get a consulting engineer from Apple uh, on, on our show either. So, you know, props, <laughs> major props. You also don't have the community around it as well. You have all these people who know the Linux system inside now can do all these incredible things with it. Well, there's certainly a community of people who will take your money and fix your computer if you mm-hmm. if you have Apple or, or Microsoft based products. Whereas the other way around on, on Ubuntu, there's plenty of people who don't want your money and will fix your computer for you. Or they'll yeah. just take your money. <laughs> well, I would also like to add, though, you know, everything I learned about Ubuntu and its derivatives, I found on the Ubuntu forums. The forums are fantastic. And, I mean, yes. anytime I was looking for an answer, you know, I would just go on Google search and I would just type in Ubuntu and whatever the problem was, and that answer would always come up because, you know, other people have experienced the same issues, and I was able to find those answers quickly and easily. And now I even have a Google custom search that actually pulls uh, the uh, just for searching the Ubuntu, the Mint sites, and uh, all the other derivatives of Ubuntu. It allows me to pretty much pull all their sites to find the answers and that sort of thing. So the forums out there are magnificent. Yeah. Yes. 
I would have to agree. Uh, by the way, Spatchy, a, a few days ago you we were sending comments back and forth messages, and you mentioned something like, uh, you know, in Arch you never get a BSOD. You never gotten a BSOD, a blue screen of death in Arch. Well, uh, I always get B. Well, I shouldn't say always, but I got a BSOD two weeks ago in Unity, a bug screen of death. So yeah. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> well, we, let me uh, tell you what. Since I switched to Arch, I have never had even one kernel panic. You it a little longer. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you need to buy some more wacky hardware. <laughs> You're probably right about that. But even then, when I had kernel panics, I usually did something stupid to cause it to happen. Like I'd have my TV card plugged in or something like that, and I unplugged it while it was running, and then the kernel would go, you know. But, right. you know, I, us- I usually had to do – there was something on my end that I was doing that would cause that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to um, I have to leave here in about five minutes to you know shower and start my day. I have a full schedule besides this. But uh, before I log off, and of course you guys and of course Tanya, you can continue on. Um, but one quick last question, Alan, have you tried or taken a look at Windows 8? Um, I tried to, and I tried to install it in a VirtualBox VM, but for some reason it just wouldn't boot, so I gave up. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I have installed it. Uh, I don't know if you caught the little Joe comments before we actually started the show, but Spatry did a little screencast a couple days ago. Now, Spatry is the consummate gentleman. I, I think he said Windows 8 is a good operating system, but would I use it? No. Let me translate that for you. He starts every show with today on Spatry's cup of Linux and goes into his little, you know, thing. Yeah, translate it. Yeah. Good. Translate that. Today on Spatry's Cup of Horse Stable, we have the latest <laughs> horse dumpings from Microsoft. Microsoft Windows. That's and funny. that is exactly what it is. I mean, okay. it's going to be magnificent for touch screens and that sort of thing, but it's going to completely bomb on the desktop. And if I were a complete neophyte, Okay, had no computing experience whatsoever. I personally think that the latest edition of Ubuntu would be a lot more attractive to me than this hunk of whatever that Microsoft mean, is cranking uh, out right now. I completely um, agree with you. Let me say this, because I have to leave here in about four minutes. You may be absolutely right, but here, here's my philosophy on this. Last year when Unity came out and then... You know, like around the same time, GNOME Shell, GNOME, Shell, GNOME 3, those, those were radical changes. And I was probably one of the few Microsoft dual booters defending those new releases. Now, they, they could have bombed too, but I suspected they would not, and, and I'm right. With Windows 8, I really liked what I saw. It is really optimized, you know, smartphones, tablets. Of course it is. Mm-hmm. But... It was stable in my virtual machine. No hiccups, no blips, none whatsoever. I was floored. Uh, I mean, slightly slow, but that's to be expected. But it worked. Everything seemed to work. Well, I didn't try everything, but, you know, switching here, switching, you know, there's a terrific hotkey function on the keyboard. You, you, you uh, tap on the super key, and you can flip between the tablet type of interface, you know, with the tiles, hit the key and switch to the somewhat normal desktop that somewhat resembles Windows 7. That is a brilliant move. But, but, I really miss my start, start orb, the start menu. Mm-hmm. And I think because Windows 8 is such a, a, a shock, such a, such a jolt, it looks pretty, and it and it, and 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 if it's stable, fine. But without that start, that simple start menu, I think they are probably going to tick off a lot of Windows users. Um, maybe even me. I, I'm not there yet. I'm willing to give this time because it is a beta. To, to be fair, but the hotkey is brilliant. Hey, if you don't like the new, hit the hit the key, switch to the old, and here's the good old fashioned start menu where everything works. If they can pull that off, then I think Windows 8 is fine. Um, will they? I think they will, but 
I'll wait to the final product to say whether Windows 8 is, you know, stable or horror stable. But for now, so it of, appears stable, but it is a jolt. One of the problems is, even if people don't like it, there's not a lot of choice. If you if you go into a computer store, you can buy one of two things: a computer running Windows or a computer running OS 10. Yes. Um, and and so and if you're in a corporate environment, you use whatever the IT department have given you. So even though people hate you know, and people hated Vista, and some people hated Windows 7. Mm-hmm. Um, if if the computer that you're using is is not controlled by you, and the delivery of the operating system is not controlled by you, yes. but controlled by someone else, then it, it doesn't really matter if you don't like it or not. You're going to have to get used to it. And this has happened before. You know, when people moved from Windows 3 to Windows 95, and when people moved from um, Windows 98 to Windows XP, or when people moved to Vista, and you know, there, there was there's always going to be some dissent and people complaining and saying, "I don't like this," um, but there's very little they can do. And this is why I'm I'm keen on focusing on us getting um, a decent desktop on computers in shops and in right, online retail right. stores, so mm-hmm. so we make it as easy yes. as possible for them to transition away from something they don't like. Listen to your customers, uh, which it appears that you are with 1204. And if, if anybody from Microsoft is listening to this, I'm telling you as a customer, Mr. <laughs> you know, guys of Microsoft, put back the start button. Uh, Just a quick comment on the start orb thing. I, I think yeah. as best as I can tell, I, I did a little bit of research on it because I did notice it did tick you off. And it does tick me off mildly as well. But I me think too. the design decision was... Uh, it's basically, you know how with GNOME Shell you hit the meta key and you get the overlay with the app yes. launcher? That's yes. basically what is replacing the start menu with the overlay of the of the Metro tiles. Right. So that right. you hit that meta key, you start typing for your app, you press enter and there's your application. So I think the functionality uh, from the start menu is going to be in that overlay or the tablet interface, the Metro yeah. the Metro interface, and that's what they're going to be using as the, 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 the app launcher. And that's why it's yeah. so easy to switch between the two because they want to yeah. have that launch menu thing right. built into yeah that overlay. So uh, my my guess is you're probably not going to be seeing the start menu. But again, that's just me. Well, no, so it's good. Yeah. No, this is good if Microsoft messes up because then this means more users for us. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Okay. Well, uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens with Microsoft. But for for me, Microsoft Windows Seven has been absolutely. Brilliant. I don't recall ever seeing a BSOD in Windows 7. I don't re- ever recall having a virus affect my system. Windows 7 is good, you know, and, and and when something's good or stable, I will say it's stable. But with Windows 8, without the start menu, I think that's borderline horse stable. That with the horse, you know, horse dumps. So, uh, <laughs> not to disagree um, with you, yeah. but I work in IT and I see many, many viruses on Windows 7. And there's many, and the only reason people stay with it is because the people I support are power users, and they have many software requirements, and they have to stay with Windows, even though they have many complaints about it. Well, so I'm not saying I haven't gotten viruses, but oh, I haven't okay. gotten, well, what, well, look, it's Windows. You're going to get a virus. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I haven't gotten one yet that passed my, that went through my virus shield. It always oh, picked it up and stopped it. Now, of course, I maintain it. Updated, you know. Sometimes I'll switch, you know, like different types, you know, of companies. Sometimes I'll use Avast or Komodo, but in what three years, not one single virus has trashed my Windows Seven. That's, That's rare. But I give look. Microsoft Wis- yeah, Microsoft Vista was horse stable. They know it. They cleaned it up with Windows Seven. I'll give them credit. With Unity, like in the beginning, it wasn't quite there, but with 1204. Alan, you guys, terrific job uh, with Windows 8. We'll see. It could turn out to be horror stable. I prefer to be fair, just like I've been fair with Unity and GNOME 3 and wait till the end. Uh, with Unity and GNOME 3, I like what I see. With Windows 8, I think I will love what I see, but we shall wait and see. All right. I need to log off. Guys, Tanya, this has been terrific. We need to do it again. Alan, if you can get Windows 8 working, uh, please come on the <laughs> next show and let me know if it's stable or horse stable because I'm <laughs> dying to hear what Spatry has to say about this. So, uh, do you know what? Uh, since I, I started working for Canonical three months ago and I haven't touched a Windows machine since, I'm quite happy about that. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
My hat's off okay. to you, sir. I haven't booted into my Windows system in ages. I don't boot into it very much. All right. Uh, Spatry, I, ha- I need to have, have you take over. Uh, no thank problem. Thank you. All this has been, yeah, thank you. This has been terrific. Let's definitely do it again. And as I like to end my screencast, I will catch all you guys and Tanya sometime in the future. <laughs> thank you. All right. All right. Thank Take you. Care. All right, Spatry, I'll catch you probably sometime tonight on Skype. Let me know how things go. And no problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Well, uh, I, I can say... Uh, that I want to say about a month or two after I switched to uh, Linux that I completely wiped my NTFS partition and um, I've actually been running all of my Windows applications natively using Wine and Wine has really come a long way and I found that I really don't need Windows anymore and as a matter of fact as time has progressed I have been switching to the Linux alternatives, and I've been very happy with them. When you look at how, for instance, the uh, the beta release of Windows 8 came out, that was 3.3 gigs in file size to download, and you really don't get much with it. I've seen Linux distributions that are 300 megs in file size that offered more than what Windows 8 offered, and uh, specifically... Uh, the day, the day before I did my review on uh, Windows 8, I did a review on the Android operating system. And it had more applications than the Windows 8. So, I mean, you know, I think this is really attractive to users, the fact that you can download a nice Linux distribution that's going to have all your pro- productivity software pre-installed with it. And in less time than it's going to take for you to install Windows, reboot install drivers, reboot, search the internet for application A, install, reboot, rinse and repeat, as Pincast likes to always say, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you know, this is, this is a really, you know, what Linux has brought to the table is really convenient, and, you know, as show hosts ourselves, it's, you know, it's it's our job to, you know, make people aware of these innovations that are available that, you know, the community has put all of their time and effort to and is freely giving this away to people. It's magnificent. No, I absolutely agree with you. Yes, this is an amazing operating system. And I think if people just took a look at it and got to know it a little bit better, they would totally embrace it. But I think it's just not in the limelight. It's not getting much press. Like um, IG was saying, right, it would be nice to have some videos to pass around. But I know the budget is scarce, so. Mm-hmm. It's not an easy task, and uh, you're going to have to probably deal with uh, anti-competitive tactics from uh, other big companies. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if they have people just flooding YouTube with you know, these Linux stinks and, you know, that sort of thing, you know, because at the end of the day, the software giants are going to do everything in their power to maintain desktop superiority. They're going to do everything they can to muscle their way into the mobile markets, even though we have one major player out there who doesn't even have much of anything in the mobile market. I'm just dying to see what kind of tactics they're going to be employing to shove their products down people's throats. But the, but at the end of the day, it's all about choice, and the end user is going to decide for themselves what they like the best, you know. And, um, and well, they can if 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 they can mm-hmm. buy a machine with you know the alternatives on. I just come back to that, you know. The the most important thing for me is that we get a quality product, and it's a product that the manufacturers actually want to put on their their machines, you know. So you mm-hmm. can go to Dell's website or, you know. HP's website or whoever, you know, buy a PC and just choose to have something other than Windows if you want to. And is that is that sorry to jump in there, but is that um is that something that you that you are looking at in the future? Because I mean, I really think you know having uh, the ability to to just select Ubuntu as an option on you know a lot of major manufacturers, obviously that would that would require you know you guys to be testing a lot of different machines, even if you just did have a select few with with each manufacturer. Uh, for you know hardware compatibility and the, and the rest, but uh, is that something that you eventually see chasing? Is is uh, more OEM installs? 
We already do. Um, we have a team who um, work with OEMs like Dell and others um, to ensure that our software works on their hardware. And, you know, we feed back uh, bug fixes to the relevant upstream projects when something needs fixing or, you know. So, so right now there's, I don't know, four laptops you can buy from Dell USA um, that all have Ubuntu on them. Um, yes, but yes, I have we, seen we, that, we, yeah. We'd like we'd like that range to be wider, but it's it's somewhat out of our control. The the OEMs decide, and in some cases the the, the head of each region decides what they want to put in their store. So, for you guys, if you go to the US Dell store, you'll see four laptops. If I go to the UK Dell store, there's no laptops. Well, I think there might be one mm. laptop that runs Ubuntu. So, and that's down to the region. They get they choose what they think will sell in their region. Um, so. It's it's not quite as straightforward as you know we could say we've tested every single machine I mean we've tested most of them, um, um, but it, you know even if we test them all and they all work fine, it's out of our control as to whether we actually they actually sell them for us. And I guess uh, one more question in that direction, and that is, uh, are we ever going to see an Ubuntu book of sorts, a uh, an Ubuntu laptop that's uh, branded by you guys? I. I hmm, I don't know. It's that, that's something that will be um, inside Mark Shuttleworth's head as to whether that's going to happen. Um, that's a decision that he and Jane Silber, the CEO, would 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 likely decide. I can't see that happening anytime soon because the margins are so tiny on hardware that you have to you have to sh- ship you know bazillions of them to make any kind of profit, and you have to be tied into some kind of store to make ongoing profit from the sales of books or music or whatever it is you're selling um, so I, I think it's more likely that you'll see more hardware vendors um, signing up and having Ubuntu as a pre-install okay completely understandable we'll get the 200 million users first and then we'll chase the Ubuntu book <laughs> exactly exactly let's not forget about system 76 they're also selling I- Ubuntu computers yeah, there's a few um, smaller vendors um, around the world who who, who sell um, computers with Ubuntu pre-installed. System 76 are great. There's, you know, they've got a nice range. It's an attractive website. It's, um, mm-hmm. you know, they're decent prices. But unfortunately, the average Joe in the street walks into, I don't know, in, in the US Best Buy, and over here it would be PC World or somewhere. You know, the mm-hmm. the big box shifting computer stores. I know my, my father-in-law just recently bought a laptop and his first reaction, even though he knows he can buy them online and he could go to Amazon or whatever and buy a laptop, his first reaction was to walk into a shop and physically touch the laptops and, and look at the specs. Despite the fact that he could look at the specs of all of them online, he mm-hmm. felt that he, it would be better for him if he walked around the shop. And those are the 200 million. It's those kinds of people that do that kind of thing, who walk into a shop and buy a computer. And, and for us geeks, we'd be like, why don't you build one? Or, you know, why, mm-hmm. why, don't, exactly. why don't you go to, to this shop online? Or why don't you go to that shop online? Why are you... Because mm-hmm. there's a premium. You know, when you go to a bricks and mortar shop, it's more expensive often than, than online. That's less so these days. But but still, you know, they try to sell you the warranty and all that kind of stuff. Um, so so I, I think we do need to target, despite it being good that there are smaller manufacturers doing that kind of thing we still need to target the big the big companies simply because they are already established in the market and they have the infrastructure to put millions of them in shops all around the world that's it and so and you know are you wanting to hopefully adopt the same sort of model with ubuntu tv ubuntu for android more providing a service that that manufacturers can come to you and and use as opposed to you know push trying to push your own uh trying to push your own wagon as it were yeah and and we we've seen you know there are um feelings in the market space it seems that that you know people don't necessarily want to put android on their devices like you know they, they feel like um maybe google is is becoming um a partner that they they don't necessarily feel comfortable being with whereas they might be more comfortable putting ubuntu on their tv or on their tablet or on their phone or whatever um so we, we need to make the most of that, you know, anti-Google feeling if we can, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. But at any rate, I, at any rate, I feel that, you know, um, 
in just by the end of this year, we're going to be seeing Ubuntu doing a lot of things, and it's slowly but surely infiltrating its way into the marketplace, and it is going to bring competition out there. And it wouldn't surprise me, though, if by the end of this year, maybe hopefully next year, we might be able to start seeing uh, Ubuntu on the store shelves. That would be refreshing to see that. Yeah, I, I, w- I would like to see that. Um, the, the the group within Canonical that I work for are working on um, you know things like Ubuntu TV and the convergence device that you saw last week. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know they're working really hard to get to get these products ready for market because they're not yeah they're, they're, what you've seen so far is a demo. It's a, a working product, but um, mm-hmm. you know it's not it's not ready to go into customers' hands yet. So. Um, but they're working really hard to to make that make that happen, and I don't know whether that will happen this year or next year, or you know, mm-hmm. we'll carry on working at it until it's right. And and that's the other thing is, I know Mark Shuttleworth doesn't want to release products before they're ready. He, mm-hmm. I know I know people in the open source world believe in release early, release often, but for a, a consumer product like a TV or a phone or a tablet. It really has to be good to put it in a shop. Mm-hmm. You, you can't put a second grade thing in and expect to get, you know, mass market adoption. It isn't going to happen. So, mm-hmm. I I wouldn't expect to see it any time like really soon. It, it's got to be really ready before it goes out. In the meantime, the rest of us the rest of us can just arm ourselves with pocket loads of live USB sticks. Go down to the local <laughs> PC store, pick out the most yeah. attractive laptops, mm-hmm. and boot up a bunch of them all of them and get people asking questions. And I have done that. Yes. Really? That, yeah. Uh, and there, there's actually something called PC hijacking where people actually go into these shops. And what they do is they bring a pocket full of live CDs. And on the actual disc itself, it basically explains this is non-destructive. It's not writing anything to the hard drive. And these people go into the stores, and they actually boot these operating systems on the brand new computers and just leave them running so people can walk up and have a look at them. But something else I wanted to touch on here is the fact that, um, for instance, uh, you know, um, we know that uh, Microsoft, for instance, every time it releases a new product, it's never ready on the day it ships, you know. But the thing is, my experience is on the day that most Linux distributions, and I say most, the most Linux distributions that I've tried, the day that they ship, they work. And they work pretty well. I've seen a few that, well, were not so well. But, um, you know, with with the uh, Microsoft, though, um, I've seen, a, you know, I've seen a number of their installments. For example, the Millennium Editions, the uh, Vistas, those weren't ready on the release date. And, uh, and uh, I can tell you I was very displeased with them. So, um it's- it's funny, we, um, you know how um, Ubuntu releases on a specific date, and mm-hmm. often news sites will tell you like the day before that it's already done, and you know you could get the ISO from some website here or there, and it's the final release, and that's all you need, and um, and, and usually that's you know roughly true, you know the the ISO image that that exists on the server a couple of days before release is is the release candidate and may well end up being the release, but on more than one occasion we've had we found proper catastrophic bugs in uh, in the release on the day or the day before it comes out and we've had to re-spin all of the ISO images and then repopulate all of the mirrors and uh, mm-hmm. yeah that's 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 not a small undertaking um, luckily these are ISO images on servers they're not CDs that we've sent out to customers or anything but um, we, we certainly do try and take care that the, the product that goes out isn't you know massively riddled with bugs <laughs> Now, something that's very interesting to me, and this this is something that I found refreshing, that uh, Ubuntu or Canonical has decided to extend their long-term releases for now five years, I believe. And uh, this this is this will be uh, welcoming to a lot of uh, uh, European governments and uh, other uh, business sectors out there that are looking for a nice stable release that they're not going, you know, that they'll be able to actually keep for several years. And, yeah. Uh, and, and one of the problems with that, there's there's a trade-off with that. If you mm-hmm. if you make a, a CD in April 2012, um, 
there are new revisions of CPUs and chipsets that go with CPUs. You know, Intel rev a new CPU every year or every other year or so. Um, and so we have to be uh, mindful of that because if if we have a CD that was created three years ago, it's possible that that CD won't work on you know the very latest hardware. So it's it's going to be released on in April, but then we're going to support it with point releases after that. So you'll get 1204 in April, and then you'll get 1204.1 a few months later, and 1204.2, yeah, yeah. which will have really do newer like kernels yeah. in it. So hopefully we'll be able to yeah support people you know for five years on the desktop and the laptop and and on the server as well. And this will also send the kernel updates and everything that they need, correct? Yeah, the point releases contain um, kernel fixes. Usually it's, it's usually hardware enablement. So uh-huh. you know when Intel come out with their brand new um, you know whatever the next thing after the Core i7 will be the next chipset. Um, we have to put kernel support in there, and sometimes we have to backport that from the next version of the kernel, um, because we do, what we don't do is if um, if this release of Ubuntu ships with Linux 3.2, we don't make the CD and then later on deliver you 3.3 or 3.4 of the kernel. We have to take the code that's been put in 3.3 and 3.4 and backport it into 3.2, which is mm. quite an undertaking, and and the kernel team at Canonical you know manage that process. Okay, wonderful. Does anybody else have any other questions? He answered all my questions. Pincas, any questions? Um, well, you were guys are making that what the new HUD thing. Yes. Um, yeah. Could you elaborate on that? I looked at it. it looks so, it kind of reminded me of Copper. It's um, so the idea behind it is it's it's not designed as a system for launching applications. That's the first thing. Um, so we have the dash, which is when you press the super key, the Windows key, mm-hmm. the dash appears. And then if you want to search for an application, you know, you just type in FI and you get Firefox, for example. But once you're actually in an application, many of them have a myriad of menus with, you know, lots of different levels deep. And, and often it's, it's actually quite painful to find the specific thing in the menu that you're looking for. Um, I know, I mean, I've been using Firefox for years and I can still never remember where certain things are in the menus. Um, and so the idea of the HUD is that it makes it easier because rather than you as a human searching through the menu, the computer searches through the menu for you. So if you're searching mm-hmm. for, I don't know, the, the downloads option in Firefox, you'd press the key that brings up the HUD and you just start typing downloads because that's what you're looking for. You're not you're not looking for the tools menu or the thing that's in the tools menu. You're looking for downloads. That's the thing you want to get to. So you just tap the alt key, a box pops up, you type in downloads, and it it has indexed all the menus of all the currently open applications, um, including all the indicators in the top right hand corner of the screen. And so any of those menus it will it will know about, know the contents of all of them, so that you can very quickly navigate to any item in a menu. And that's that's most useful in applications that have very deep menu structures like the GIMP or Inkscape or other, you know, really busy, creative applications that have lots of menu options. It's, it's really most useful in those kind of things. Thank you for shedding light on that. I was wondering <laughs> what that was. I was playing around because I was playing around in the beta yesterday and uh, I was reading somewhere that you just press the alt key and it brings up the HUD and that sort of thing. But I, but apparently I didn't have any applications open. And so now that you have explained that, now I can sit down and actually play with this later and try it out and give it a test run. So yeah, it makes, I, it makes less less sense when you have no applications open if you just press Alt. It, 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 uh-huh. you, could, you could type shutdown, for example, um, if you press Alt, because the only thing you've got open is all the indicators in the top right. And so it will search those. Yeah. So if you've got nothing open, you press Alt and you type shut, it will find the shutdown option. And then you press enter and it will shut your laptop down. Oh, wonderful. Um, but but if you've got a, an application open like Thunderbird and you want to create a new mail, you could press Alt and then type new and it will find the create new mail menu option and and off you go. That's that's the theory behind it. That is magnificent and that 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 will increase the usability of the operating system. So that that sounds like a really nice touch that's been added there. Yeah, and in future, it may well it may well be that um, if we get speech recognition 
uh, in Ubuntu, then in the future oh, yeah. you, you press a key and type down and, and say the word download, and it finds the menu option for you mm-hmm. rather than you know you having to actually type the thing in. Maybe I don't know. Now I imagine that would be something that probably wouldn't be too difficult to implement. I already have an Android phone, and the thing is. All I have to do is just say, call so-and-so, and and my phone dials them out without having to even pick a number out or anything like that. So the technology is there already. Yeah, um, and I don't know whether um, there are many – well, I know there are some open source projects that do speech recognition, um, and I don't know whether they're ready for prime time because – what well, you've got to factor in is on a, on a phone, there's a, a fairly limited set of things you're going to ask it to do. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas when you've got an entire repository of applications, each of which has their own menu, each of which is a piece of text that the developer wrote, that could be any word in any language, because these are all fully translated applications, it, it becomes an awful lot harder. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that could be a developer nightmare waiting yeah. to happen. <laughs> Someone's going to have that fixed at some point, I'm sure. Exactly. Well, with that, gentlemen, I I shall have to take my leave. Thank you very much for having me on the show uh, this morning. And, uh, yeah, I definitely appreciate uh, hearing all the the comments and the topics floating around. And, yeah, thank you, uh, Alan, also for showing up and uh, and answering all of our questions. But, uh, yeah, with that, I shall have to uh, let you all go. And, uh, yeah, thank you for having me on the show once again. All right, and welcome once again, Infinitely Galactic. It's always a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, uh, we really appreciate you being here. We look forward to speaking with you again in the future. No worries. I shall be here. All right, you take care. Cheers, bye. Catch you later. Have a good day. Take care. We've literally been spanning the uh, the uh, globe here uh, for all of the listeners. We've got... Uh, Tanya in California, Pinkass and I are on the East Coast, and uh, so let me see, uh, it's probably, um, well, it's 9.30 here Eastern Time, so it's probably 5.30 in the morning where Tanya is, and then uh, it's uh, probably 2 o'clock in the afternoon where Alan is, and it was, it, or 2.30 uh, in the afternoon where Alan is, and Infinitely Galactic that just signed off, it's... Um, 1.30 or 2.30 in the morning for him. Wow. <laughs> so we've li- literally, you know, been, you know, this, this one, um, we've really, uh, been challenged by multiple time zones. And that's probably why we weren't able to get as many guests on the show that we were hoping for this time around. So, uh, I'll be, uh, working with, uh, the other show hosts in the future to work out a better time frame so that we can get, uh, better participation. And that sort of thing, because these, you know, these chats are really enjoyed uh, by the uh, by the public and that sort of thing. And they keep asking us for more, 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 more. So, you know, this is this is really engaging and entertaining the public and that sort of thing. Yeah. And they they absolutely love it. Now, um, for me, also, uh, I'm running out of time as well. I have some daily business and that sort of thing I have to get uh, get going on here. Sure. So I, does, have, I have two children who need me to help them with their homework. So <laughs> <laughs> understood completely. So uh, so uh, it, so uh, does anybody have any final comments that, they, that they'd like to make before we close this? I just really um, want to thank him for answering all our questions. It was really great listening to you. Oh, thanks. No problem. And and. I'd love to come on again anytime and if you have any more questions or if you have, and you know, I, I realize on this occasion it was all pretty positive and there was, you know, very little, you know, we hate Ubuntu, we hate canonical and I'm happy for, if you have any, you know, listeners or uh, other podcasters who have a, you know, less positive view, I'm happy to discuss stuff with them as well so that we get, you know, the full rounded view and it's not all just happy clappy, you know, Ubuntu is great. Yeah, uh, Definitely. And uh, for one reason, uh, I was really hoping that Linux for you and me was going to make it for the to this show because he is definitely one of the largest Ubuntu haters if uh, (laughs) if, uh, that that I know of. Um, And so it would have been really nice to get his point of view on that. But um, I, I know he said he had something else to take care of today and he couldn't join us, but you can bet we will eventually get him on the show and get you two in the same room 
<laughs> we will hand you each some boxing gloves and let you guys duke it out. I think it would be great for the listeners, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure I'm sure it will make for an invigorating conversation to say the least. I might even have to pull out the bleep button <laughs> if the if the conversation gets a uh, gets a little bit too much for. Uh, for our viewers and that sort of thing. All right, well, to everybody who's listening, I'd like to thank you all for listening in on our show. I'd like to thank uh, Alan Pope for joining us. It's been a magnificent conversation. Tanya, Sis Admin Girl, thank you. Pingcast, thank you. Total OS Today, thank you. Infinitely Galactic, thank you. And thank all of you for listening to yet another fabulous Tosscast podcast. We'll probably be back in about two weeks with another show. And then, of course, I'll be doing some one-on-one shows as well with some other different uh, show hosts and that sort of thing. So you'll definitely want to stick around on all of these channels. Every channel that uh, has been represented here, has wonderful content that is well worth your time. And you will see all that information up on the screen. I'd like to thank you all for listening, and we will see you next time.